Hello, I'm Andrea Gordon and this is TV Apex and today I'm joined by Mara Ahmed who is a filmmaker um, and she's made two films. Um, is it two or is it three? It's actually two, uh, two and films. I'm working on the third one. Okay, made two films. They're documentaries and they are about being an American Pakistani and about Pakistan and what's going on with Pakistan. And I think we'll go on to the third one later date where that will be about India. So first of all, welcome, Mara. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, why? Why did you get drawn to making filmmaking? Um, well, I've always loved films. Uh, I appreciate films and I like to watch films and I like to kind of take them apart and analyze them and d dissect them and write reviews. But um, I never really dreamed that I would one day be making films myself because it just seemed like such a complex and almost impossible uh, enterprise that right. I never thought I would be making films. And um, the, the reason that I got into filmmaking was is actually very specific. It was um, because I felt that there was uh, a need for a response from the Muslim community to all the stereotyping that happened, uh, especially in the United States, post 9-11. Right, okay. Because just to, to recap, your background was quite uh, opposite yes. from filmmaking and arts. It was, uh, you had a, an economics master's deg yes. degree? I yes, I have a master's in business administration and right. then I got another master's in economics. So two master's degrees Yes. in something completely unrelated to the arts. Completely different. So and where, why, how did the decision come to make films? Um, you know, once you get a certain kind of education and then you get into the job market and you kind of keep moving forward in your career, it becomes more and more difficult to kind of get out of that and do something different. And for right. me, um, art was always my passion. Right. Uh, so whether it be film or theater or uh, plastic arts or um, literature, writing, uh, that was that has always right. been my passion. That creative expression was important yes. to you. Yes. yes, very, very important yeah. to me. And, and, and so at a certain point in my career, I decided to just quit and I resigned from my job and I went back to school and started taking art classes. Wow, okay, <laughs> <laughs> brave decision. So you mentioned 9-11, um, as, a, as a Muslim, how did that affect you living in the Rochester area, in New York? Yes, yes, in upstate New York. Yeah. Um, I think it affected all Muslims, uh, all American Muslims in a, in a very major way because I think it kind of changed our identity forever. It changed how everybody else viewed us, and I think it also changed how we viewed ourselves. Um, so, so from what to what? What was it like before? Yeah, um, I actually moved to the U.S. in the 19, um, early 1990s after I got married. My husband was doing a residency, a medical residency, um, at the University of Connecticut. So we moved because of that. And, and this was an arranged marriage? Yes. Yes. <laughs> It yep. was an arranged marriage in the sense that I didn't know my husband. Our families, our parents knew each other. And my husband had uh, once visited my home with his mom right. uh, to visit my mom. And he had seen the house was filled with my paintings uh, right. because I, I paint and my mother you know, used to frame everything and it was all over the house. And so he saw that and he was very intrigued by it. He fell in love with your paintings. He fell in love with the Aww. paintings, truly. And so <laughs> he went back home and he had seen me, but he had never really spoken to me because, you know, we were neighbors. So we had seen each other around, but didn't know each other. So he went back home and he said to my mother, I would like to marry the girl who made all the paintings. Oh, my and gosh. That's Romantic. <laughs> <laughs> kind of an interesting story. Yes, very much so. Uh, so you were regarded as a as a Muslim living in uh, New York. Yes. As, as um, I mean, uh, before the, nine eleven. This yeah, is. before nine in, in the early nineteen nineties. You know, I, I was uh, living in Connecticut. I was working there. But I, my kids were born there, and people didn't really know much about Islam mm. or even Pakistan. Sometimes if I told people that I was from Pakistan, they would think that it's a part of India. Yeah. Um, it, it, so it was, uh, our identities were really, it, it was kind of very blurry and abstract for people. And then suddenly. And which was kind of fine. You know, I yeah. was more than happy to educate people about yes. my background or my religion or whatever. But then all of a sudden. You're you know, in the limelight. We're in the limelight. Big we're term. like under the microscope. Yes. And then it's not just that, it's just that all the things that are being said about us are so inaccurate or 
um, so distorted that mm. we don't recognize ourselves in right. all of that. And that's what the media are talking about all the time. Right. I, I mean, you talk about in uh, your film, of which we'll see a clip in a moment, about being a moderate Muslim <laughs> and you hate the term. Tell us why and what it means. Uh, I, the reason I feel very uncomfortable with the term moderate Muslim is because it is a post 9-11 description of Muslims yeah. and it's like saying a normal Muslim and so the implication is normal versus what right which you don't say like um, yeah this really good friend of mine is a Christian she's a normal Christian right or this really uh, nice colleague of mine is a normal Jew you don't mm. say that yeah so why do you need that Qualifier, that distinction, that yes. distinction yes. whenever you're talking about a Muslim because is the the is the implication that Muslim, that there's something weird about Muslims and so you always have to qualify that oh, I'm not one of those weird yeah. Muslims I'm a normal Muslim so I yeah. find that offensive actually. yes well, let's go to a clip this is from Muslims I know this is the first film that you made which yes. has been shown on the PBS channel in uh, yes it was shown Manchester. on PBS which is the public broadcasting corporation in the US and yeah that's yeah. kind of what happened um, it wasn't just the books there was um, <coughs> millions and millions of dollars that were poured into that region at that time and a lot of the money uh, was actually funneled through the Pakistani government into Afghanistan and in parts uh, of the northwestern frontier of Pakistan itself which are now as we know uh, have become these problematic regions uh, well, a lot of money was poured in that region, and a lot of arms and ammunition also flowed in there. Uh, I mean, we had these trucks in Pakistan because, um, like, like I say in the film, I grew up in Brussels, but we actually returned to Pakistan in the 1980s when General Zia was uh, the, the military dictator there. And you would see, and we lived in Islamabad for, for a long time, and we would see these big, huge trucks, um, very different from the local trucks we have because we have these really chunky big trucks which are painted in Pakistan and that's you know the mode of transportation so that's what we know of trucks over there but these were really sleek long huge trucks you know very kind of high-tech cutting edge and you would see them moving around all the time you know uh, rows and rows of these trucks going along well apparently these were trucks which were taking ammunition into Afghanistan hard-hitting stuff yes so uh Pakistan, you've been back to Pakistan since the 1980s? Uh, since the 1990s, which is ah. when I moved to the US. I, I've been back maybe three or four times, mostly to attend weddings and right. then also to, to shoot films. Okay. So the last time I went there was in 2009 and I went there to shoot a film that I'm working on right now, which is about the partition of India. Ah, interesting. We'll come to that later on because yes. it's very much in the news at the moment, isn't India? Yeah, yeah. So it's, that's a very interesting film and I'm collaborating with an Indian filmmaker on that project. Okay. Um, so I went there to shoot some interviews related to that film, but then just found Pakistan to be so changed from the time that I grew up in right. Pakistan in the 1980s right. that I decided to shoot a second film right there and then. So 1980s, little Mara, <laughs> growing up. Yes. How was Pakistan? Uh, Pakistan was actually at that time under the dictatorship, uh, the military dictatorship of General Ziaul Haq. Right. And I think that's such an important period in history, not just for Pakistan, but I think also for a lot of what's going on in the world right now. Yeah. Um, so uh, for, for, for me personally, uh, you know, I was very aware at that time and we moved to Pakistan in 1980 from Brussels, which is where I really grew up and ah, started going to school okay. and all of that. So just the, the, the change, you know, the shift from Europe, from Brussels to going back to Pakistan, to Islamabad, was really dramatic mm. and there was it was a very oppressive environment in Pakistan uh, there was no free speech there was no political process um, there did was you feel that at the time of being there was it because you're used to that that was just the way it was and or did you feel that oppression when you were there in the 80s no I definitely felt it even as a child I mean I was a right. child then but I definitely felt it for example um, there was a time uh, in the early 1980s when General Zaul Haq decreed that uh, all girls had to wear chadars. So I remember that very, very vividly. Had that to wear? Chadars is, um, is um, basically something to cover yourself. It's a wrap right. that you cover yourself okay. with. Yeah. Um, and you had to wear it over your head. Um, and that was obligatory, so there was no way to get out of that. And I remember even as a child kind of rebelling against that, like, I don't, <laughs> why should I? I don't want to yeah. wear it. And why do I have to? 
So, and then it went away after a few years because it right. was just such a ridiculous idea. You know, she, he was making schoolgirls wear that as well. Yes. Uh, but, they, you know, I, I definitely felt the oppression. Right. So there's always a free spirit trying to get out. You're always a bit of a rebel. Yes. 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 <laughs> Definitely. And then going back in recent times to... And then, so going back in 2009, right. um, the, the, one of the big differences... The whole world I, had changed by then, hadn't it? Not just that's Pakistan. True. But that's yes. true. But in Pakistan, I think especially uh, because, how, because of how the media culture has changed. Uh, in the 1980s, there was only one television channel. It was called right. Pakistan uh, PTV, Pakistan Television. Right. And, uh, it was basically a government-owned channel. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the only entertainment available to you. And uh, a lot of the time, it was just used to spout government propaganda or just you had these religious clerics kind of just explaining, right. you know, Islam or explaining a passage from the Quran or something like that. And that was it. Well, it really sort so, of humorous stuff then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in a way, it was good because we, I, we read a lot of books. I mean, there was no other entertainment really. So right. I, most of the other kids my age as well, we were just v voracious readers. Yeah. So in a way, I think which it is was not good. bad for which your imagination and your creativity. Yeah, yeah, it was. So that was good. But now in 2009, I just could tell the difference between the 1980s and how the media had changed, and how you have so many independent TV channels and newspapers, and they are not. They're quite fearless. Right. They're not at all afraid to say whatever they want about the government. Uh, the kind of p uh, abrasive political debate that I saw on TV was something that I have actually never seen in the United States, right. where politics is very tame. Yes. Actually, yes. I have to say. Yeah. Um, and in here in Britain, we have, I think it's like a 48% turnout to the polls, you know, which is disgraceful in yeah. a democratic. Yes. <laughs> and, so, and, and so in Pakistan, I see this contrast with all these people who are just so politically engaged. Everyone is watching the news every day. They're interested not just in what's going on in Pakistan, but also what's going on abroad, what's going on in America, because they know mm. how much American foreign policy affects, affects them. Yes, so absolutely. it's just that excitement was something so new that I wanted to share that with American audiences, and so right. I shot a second film. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to a clip of um, you traveling to Pakistan, and uh, it shows it beautifully, what you just uh, said, but let's go to the clip now. I grew up in the 1980s under General Zia's dictatorship. There was, at that time, one state-owned TV channel which spouted government propaganda 24-7. There was no freedom of speech, no political process. Pakistan is a different country now. Independent media have fostered an engagement on the part of the citizenry. That engagement is very palpable. For example, a grassroots lawyers' movement was successful in reinstating the judiciary. More recently, the democratically elected government of Pakistan was forced to restore the constitution to its pre-martial law origins. These achievements are unprecedented. And I should just mention that that was a clip from Pakistan one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and also, can we see these over here in uh, Great Britain? I know it's been showing everywhere in Rochester area, on university campuses, the lot. Yes. Can we see it here? Have you got a website even that people could go to? Uh, oh, yeah. That, actually, I do have a website. Um, it's under the name of my production company, which okay. is Neelum Films. It's N-E-E-L-U-M we'll, Films. We'll get that at the end of the... Yeah. But they can... Yeah. So they can me. go there and get in more information yes. about all the films that I've We'll give out the on. details at the end of the show. Okay. So let's uh, go on to some a little bit more um, uh, sensitive, let's say. Um, we have now a situation where there's a lot of fear about Muslims, obviously from 9-11, etc. Um, probably a lot of ignorance as well. Yes. Um, how do you, I know the film deals it for, with it very well in Mus Muslims I know, but how do you deal with this image that Muslims have and how do others deal with this, this violent image, this negative image that they have? Um, well, it's very difficult to deal with it because um, of the way Muslims are portrayed in mainstream media. 
um, and I can talk about the United States. Uh, there are these um, just sweeping generalizations that are made about Islam and Muslims. And uh, first of all, you know, the, the whole concept of saying Muslims and viewing them as a monolithic cat category is problematic right. for me. Because what do you mean when you say Muslim, what do you mean really? Do you mean Muslims in uh, Turkey? Do you mean Muslims in Tunisia, Algeria, you know, Northern Africa? Do you mean Muslims in the Indian subcontinent, Pakistan, India? A uh, large number of Muslims in India, by the way, Bangladesh. Do you mean Muslims in Europe or in America? I mean, Muslims, Islam is very cosmopolitan. Yeah. So are we talking about Indonesia? You know, which Muslims are we talking about? Muslims speak different languages. They have different rites and rituals and different ways of believing in Islam as well. Right. Different interpretations of Islam as well. So the diversity within Islam is so stunning that the very concept of talking about Muslims as if they were just this one monolithic category is very problematic and quite ridiculous, yeah. I would say. Okay, so how does one address that problem then? Because uh, I don't know that there are different um, ways of being as a Muslim, although it's probably obvious because there are different ways of being in every religion. Exactly. But until you're told that, yeah. and until you're shown that, then you don't have any idea. How does one show that? How yeah. does one, uh, through communication, Yes, absolutely. And through alternative media, and I think that's one of the reasons I made the film, right. was I just felt um, so frustrated that people were talking about us, about Muslims, all the time. Uh, that they were talking at us and about us, but that we were shut out of that discourse. Right. So we yeah. were not allowed to be a part of this discussion about us, our culture, our religion, our traditions. So it's very frustrating to be in that position. And so it's, and it's very difficult to get into mainstream media. For example, if you see an article in the New York Times, and this has happened to me and many other people I know, and you find that it's prejudiced or that it's inaccurate and you write a letter to the editor, it's not going to be published. But why? Why is that? Because the media in, in America, at least I can speak for the United States, uh, the media are owned by corporations. So Here Disney too. and General Electric also own the major newspapers in the country. Yeah. So they obviously have a very set, a very specific political agenda. And anything that goes against it is not going to be shown. Right. Uh, you won't hear about it. So, you know, it's in the, how they select the stories that they want to present and how the slant that they put on those yeah. stories is all very, it's, it's all very managed. It's very controlled. Right. So almost you were up against a, a tide of this is the way it is. Yes. We have decided that all Muslims are bad. Yes. And you can't even have any right to reply. Yes. True, you, true democracy. Yeah, like you can't break <laughs> into that you right. know, discussion. So that, that's why I decided to make a film, because if a film is independently financed, yeah. then it can be screened anywhere and no one can stop that. And with the internet, you've got access to filming it everywhere. Absolutely. Which is perfect. Absolutely. Yes. Um, I think we'll just um, go to one of the clips, actually, on um, Islam and violence. So let's just see that. Today, more than ever in American history, we are bombarded by images and sound bites coming from the media. This information is carefully crafted for our consumption and part of a larger story the media want to tell. Have the media been balanced in portraying Islam and Muslims? 9-11 was brought what brought Muslims into focus, into focus in a very negative way. But the long-term effects of it was that there was suddenly an interest. I mean, everyone overnight became an expert on Islam and Muslims, even people who couldn't say Muslim. You know, they were saying Muslims. And I still remember hearing Walter Cronkite say on television, Mohammedans. So, you know, we were Muslims or Muhammad. They didn't know you know, who we were, but everyone became an, um, became an expert. And it didn't occur to them that there are people here who are extremely educated, historians, politicians, people that they could have gone to, where, to to get their information. But no, they wanted to give the information as they wanted. And of course, much of it was very negative, much of it was stereotyping. And, uh, you know, especially CNN, and I say this totally without any hesitation, that they're stuck on that one image of Afghan women covered from head to toe in a burqa, and they can't move beyond it. You know, it's like they're stuck on that one slide. But 
then I look at it from their perspective and I and I realize that this wasn't about showing Muslims in a good light. You know, this was basically a way of saying that these are people who are barbarians and these are people. So it's it's all right and justifiable for us to go in there and liberate them, to go in there and attack them, to go in there and put our forces there. How else are they going to justify it? Hello again. So another um, delicate subject, let's say, is um, Islam and women. Mm -hmm. Now, as we are both female, you've probably noticed, um, I think the world is quite a harsh place sometimes yes. um, for our gender, um, but never more so it would seem in Islam. Uh, would you agree with that statement? No, I don't agree with that statement. Okay. And um, I think it's interesting that that's um, one of the issues that is kind of highlighted by Western media, Western mainstream media, I should say, because alternative media do exist and they're doing a wonderful job. For example, in America, I have to mention Democracy Now!, right. which uh, Amy Goodman is just a fantastic journalist and you can watch that show on the internet. So you can get the information, especially through the internet. There's a lot that's available now. But mainstream media is a completely different story. Right. And so they like to talk a lot about Islam and the oppression of women. But I feel very strongly that the oppression of women is, is happening all over the world, like you said. Yeah. Uh, it's not just in Muslim countries. And I also feel that a lot of the times, um, the political context is completely missing from that discussion. So you can talk about the rights of uh, women in Afghanistan and how uh, people are trampling on those rights. But you're not talking about the occupation of Afghanistan. You're not talking about 30 years of war in Afghanistan. 30 years is more than World War I and right. World War II put together. Mm -hmm. That's how long that country has been at war because before the Americans invaded, the, the Soviets had occupied the countries. So we need to talk about that political context. I mean, just imagine if uh, England had been at war for 30 years, then what would be the status of women in this country? It would be quite different, I'm sure. Yes. Well, yes, it would. Um, I suppose I'm going from the ignorant Westerner point of view. Right. Um, I'm allowed to, uh, I see you too, uh, leave your hair uncovered. I'm allowed to titivate my hair. Right. I'm allowed to wear makeup. I'm right. allowed to, if I want to wear a short skirt, and um, I walk around, and it is my right to walk around like right. that without inviting any unwanted sexual attention. Right. So it would seem, from this ignorant Westerners' point of view, that Islamic women or Muslim women are not allowed that choice. Would that be a fair statement? I think in some cases, absolutely, it's a, it's a fair statement. But in other cases, I also think that a lot of women choose to dress like that. Right. Uh, and I think that they are free to choose to dress like that. And sometimes it's also, I think, especially post 9-11, it's almost um, a reaction to the way Islam is portrayed in Western media, is that a lot of young people whose parents, for example, whose mothers don't wear the hijab, prefer to wear the hijab because I think yeah. it's a way in which they assert their identity. Uh, I mean, religion is much more than just uh, whether you pray in a church or a synagogue oh, or a yeah. mosque. It's much more than that. It's, it's a lot about identity. Yeah. And the way we dress is a lot about identity. You know, yes. how do you separate that from who you are, how you perceive yourself? You know, how do you want to project yourself? It's a very complex thing. Yeah. And so I find it very, very comical that um, Western media can be so... Um, critical of, let's say, the Taliban asking their women to dress a certain way. But then in France, uh, a group of men in suits can get in a boardroom and make a decision about how a woman should not be wearing a scarf. Mm. You see, I find both things to be equally offensive. Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, it's down to choice, isn't it, about, as opposed absolutely. to dictating? Yes. Absolutely. I mean, it's all about this communication thing as well, because I, I as a Western female, would like to have sat um, with someone, and probably we will do this one day, who was wearing the hijab mm -hmm. and say, you know, what do you think of me not wearing it? Because mm -hmm. I think a, a lot of our uh, fear comes from what we are supposing is going on with the other person. Yes. Are they thinking badly of, of me? Yes. Are they thinking that I'm some kind of loose woman? <laughs> you know? um, so once that's clarified, once we have that bridge of communication, mm -hmm. then we can all go forward. Absolutely. And let yeah. a, 
let each other choose. I agree with you so much and I think that's what I try to do in my films is to have this kind of dialogue that you're talking about where you just sit together and you talk about how you feel about each other. Yeah. That's what I tried to do in my first film, The Muslims I Know. Yeah. I tried to start a dialogue between American Muslims and American non-Muslims. Oh. You know, why don't you guys just sit and talk about talk the about things it, yes. that make you feel uncomfortable. Yeah. And then in my second film in Pakistan One on One, I'm again trying to do the same thing. I'm trying for an American audience to have a dialogue. Well, let's just go to a clip of um, Muslims I Know, um, of women talking about the hijab. Um, over to you. I find the prayers to be very beautiful. I like the idea that I can stand before God without a mediator and that in my prayer life there is direct communication with God. It's a time of renewal of our faith, as it were. We, we fast and we appreciate all the things that we have in our lives. The fact that in Islam, charity is a religious duty. I love that that we must share whatever it is that God has granted to us for our use. And uh, although I haven't been on the pilgrimage uh, to Mecca, I, I believe that must be such a wonderful unifying experience to go and to uh, be with Muslims from all over the world, from all races, all colors, all creeds, and just to feel the oneness with everybody. Hello, welcome back again. Um, so Mara, Touching upon our sensitive subject again of um, the war on terror and uh, it affected us in Britain here greatly obviously um, and you've said how it affected you with 9-11 etc but I see that um, from your film uh, Pakistan One on One there's a lot of people with a lot of very strong viewpoints about the whole war on terror and particularly about the USA's hand in that and, and uh, role that they have to play. Can you elaborate a bit more on that for us? Sure. Um, I think in Pakistan people are very much aware of the kind of the historical backdrop to the war on terror. And like I was saying initially, um, a lot of it is connected to what happened in Afghanistan in the 1980s. Um, and in the 1980s, when General Zaul Haq was a military dictator in Pakistan, uh, the Soviets had actually, in fact, um, invaded Afghanistan and were occupying it. And so America was involved in this indirect war against the Soviet Union by, they were doing that by supporting the Mujahideen right. uh, who were fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan. And a lot of that weaponry, a lot of that financial help uh, coming from America and Saudi Arabia. So again, it's right. interesting yeah. how in politics there is no Islam or mm. Christianity or whatever, you know, it's. Uh, uh, people choose sides in, in a very different way. It's, right. it's all very political. So um, this aid was being funneled into Afghanistan to the Mujahideen through Pakistan. And General Ziaul Haq was, of course, making that possible. And therefore, it, he was America's best friend right. because he was making all of this possible. Um, and then during that war, um, what happened was that this very fundamentalist, very kind of uh, narrow Islamic ideology was used to inflame people's passions and to make them go to war against the infidel Soviets. Right. So this was done in a very considered and strategic fashion. Mm. And um, the United States was definitely a part of that. And uh, pa the Pakistani government, the Pakistani military facilitated that. Uh, a lot of the people that we now call the Taliban were young Afghans uh, living in refugee camps inside of Pakistan who were then sent to these madrasas where they were indoctrinated in mm -hmm. a way and brainwashed and then sent back to, Paki to Afghanistan to fight the Soviets. Right. So, you know, this, all of this has a lot of background and it affected Pakistan in very, very deep ways as well because Ge General Ziaul Haq's rule kind of changed Pakistan forever and people are still dealing with the consequences of that. Did it turn people against each other? Did they take real, I mean, did they take real opposite sides or was everyone on the same level of this is how we have to be? Um, what do you um, mean? Did, did, did people turn against each other in a, almost like a, a civil war kind of, uh, like one person believing this is how it's going, it should be, the Taliban is absolutely right, and others saying no, this is absolutely wrong? Was there that kind of polarism, I think? Well, it, you know, it, 
the Taliban came into the picture a little bit later. Uh, initially, the, the people who were fighting the Soviets, these warriors, were called the Mujahideen. Um, and um, there's a very interesting clip of some of these uh, Mujahideen leaders coming to the United States and being received with open arms and embraced by President Reagan. Right. So they were that close. Um, and then the, after the Soviets left, after the Afghans won that war and the Soviets you know, had to leave, um, the, there was this really dark period in Afghanistan where all of these warlords who knew nothing but to fight mm. took over the country and kind of started fighting amongst themselves. And right. there was just massive destruction and rape and horrors visited on the people of Afghanistan. Right. So they call that like the, their, one of their darkest periods. Right. And then the Taliban were a response to that. The Taliban came in and cleaned that up. So they did bring with them some kind of law and order. It was, of course, very harsh. Uh, you know, if you raped someone, you were hanged that very day. You were executed immediately. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it, it brought some law and order and some safety to the people of Afghanistan. And so they welcomed the Taliban initially. Yeah. They welcomed them. Yeah. Is it an, a fair or unfair statement to say that Muslims are violent? and that this image we have of them being violent. How, how does that, I mean, we're going to cut to a clip in a moment that shows exactly what people think about that. Right, but right. how do you think about it? Um, no, I don't think that Muslims are more violent than anybody else. I mean, I think um, the war in Iraq was one of the most horrible things that we've seen in recent history that I've certainly seen in my lifetime. Yeah. Uh, about a million people were killed. Yeah. Uh, about 10 million people were displaced and became either in internal or international refugees. Mm. Um, I know Iraqis who eventually, you know, were able to move to the United States and I know what their families have been through. So if you don't call that violence, then I don't know what you call it. And at that scale, at that level where millions and millions of people are affected. Yeah. Uh, torture, I think, is very violent. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, what's going on in Guantanamo, putting someone in prison uh, without any due process, without a trial, indefinitely, keeping them in solitary confinement for years years and years and years is very violent as well. Absolutely. So it's a bit funny to me that yeah. um, Muslims are considered to be violent because I think there's so much violence in the world and it's coming from everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's, well, let's cut to this clip. It's one of my favorite clips of the film um, where particularly where one gentleman says exactly what he thinks about the <laughs> USA and their role to play in the whole of the war. I think the first thing that needs to be established is that whether it's a war on terror or a war of terror, as a recent article said, I think the problem is America spends so much money on its defense budget every year that if for like five or six years they have no war to fight, they just need an excuse to bomb someone. Fine, what I'm not trying to say that what happened at 9-11 did not warrant a retaliation. Fine, it was. But if America is such a proponent of civilization, uh, proportionality and everything, how can it justify one 9-11, saying that one 9-11 equates to ruining two countries, Iraq, Afghanistan, and then now a third one, apparently, Pakistan. Where does the, the whole civilization of America go here? The question is, where does the serpent's head lie? The fact that all over the world there are issues dealing with the Muslim identity, with the uh, Muslim sovereignty, with statehood, with nationhood. When you look at Palestine, when you look at Kashmir, when you look at Serbia, when you look at uh, the idea of ethnic cleansing, when you look at the idea of hegemony, uh, all these are issues that began a very long time ago. The present U.S. policy is best described by the, uh, the term that the uh, Obama administration has now used, f Park war. So they, they are planning, they, what they have in their mind is that Afghanistan and Pakistan are somehow linked and they have the similar condition and please come to Pakistan, come to Afghanistan and see that there are differences here. So you need to be a bit more realistic. They cannot be helpful, but they can be non-interventionist. That's the maximum thing we can ask for them. If you take it in terms of international law, if you're challenging someone's sovereignty, <coughs> it's a huge, 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 huge injustice. So what needs to be understood is that, you know, it's a local problem. It's something that has cultural, cultural constraints and cultural background to it. And if they're going to try and come into and deal with something that they're not really, uh, that they don't really know of, that they're not really aware of, that they don't have full information about. They won't do the right thing. Instead of 
bombarding Pakistani uh, towns coming from Afghanistan, you need to give that equipment to Pakistan itself. Number one. Number two, as far as the region is concerned, there needs to be equality. Pa when India, uh, when pa US says that India will get the nuclear technology, then Pakistan, the, the Pakistani government as well as the people have legitimate concerns that we are the strategic partners. We are not getting anything and they are getting everything when, even when they are doing nothing. So I think there should, there's a need for a major policy rethinking. So to mean, very outspoken gentleman and um, very articulate. Very good. Um, so where did you find the people from for your films? I was in Pakistan for only a week, which considering how long it takes to get there wow. <laughs> is kind of crazy. Yeah. And I already had all of these interviews scheduled for my other films. So this film I kind of just shot in my spare time. So literally it's a very random sample of people. It's not at all something that I put a lot of thought in. It's not that I was trying to show you a certain kind of yeah. person or anything like that. Probably work better then. Yeah, it's Might very better. random. Yes. Um, and one of um, the interviews was with, and you'll have to forgive me because I don't know how to pronounce her name, Navid. Navid Shahzad. Who is, um, well, you'll see on the clip what we'll show you in a few minutes, but she, I think she's a real feminist. She is a feminist, definitely, and she's kind of a legend in Pakistan. She's um, always been very, very much involved in the arts mm. um, and is like this very admired figure in yes. Pakistan. Yes, and very articulate. Very articulate, very beautiful. Yes, <laughs> but she makes a statement, which we'll see in a moment, about the Taliban, which apparently you completely disagree with. Yes, I do. I do disagree with that. And I, I have to say that she's also a very gracious woman. Yes. Um, I just walked into her office because I didn't have much time to plan anything. And she granted me an interview. Which so is fantastic. Fantastic. Yes. Um, but I, I don't quite agree with uh, what she says um, as far as the Taliban. Um, just let us know what, because we'll see the clip in a moment. Let us know what she says. Um, she basically talks about how it's impossible to negotiate with the Taliban right. and uh, because it's impossible to understand what's going on in their heads. Yeah. And I, I don't feel that way about anyone because I feel that, and I feel a lot of that is happening in the West and it's probably happening in Muslim countries as well in some way where you otherize someone, a section of the population or someone, and then it becomes okay to treat otherwise. them otherwise, which right. means dehumanize. Um, and so, and, and so I, I, I always have trouble with otherizing yes. or dehumanizing yeah. anyone, even if it's the Taliban. And with absolutes, if it's never, and with absolutes. then you've already formed an impossibility. Exactly. Yeah. And so the Taliban, you know, they, they, they might be doing things which are repulsive. I, I agree with that. And there are many people who do things which are repulsive, yeah. not just the Taliban. Um, but I think that we have to understand the socio-political context in which they exist and which makes it possible for them to exist. And then we have to do something about that. Right. But going to war against everyone that we disagree with, going to war against criminals, really, because that's the way I see the Taliban mm. are just sometimes just criminals. Yeah. So you don't go against, you don't, uh, you can't end crime by going to war against it mm. and by invading countries. So that's not what we do in, yes. in our own countries. Uh, that's, for example, if you knew that a murderer was living in a certain block in London, you wouldn't blow up that whole block to get rid of well, that. Well, you might. <laughs> If you, you never know. I guess. <laughs> um, and so I, I don't think that it's a very wise strategy because that's no. only going to create more problems. Absolutely, it's going it's to create revenge and it's tactics. Going, and at yes. the cost of immense human suffering, yeah. which we must account for. Yes, there's a, a, another lady on uh, the clip that we'll see in a moment um, who advocates that you talk through yes. the Taliban, yes. which is, uh, dare I say, a very feminine point of view to to reconcile and um, to, to communicate yes. and to empathize. I totally agree with you. That is so true. I do believe very strongly that war itself is a very masculinist concept. Yes. And you so heard it here. Absolutely. So I totally agree with you. It's a very yeah. uh, feminine way, I think, of dealing with issues and problems. It's, it's very true. I mean, there was a, a study um, a bit before our time, and the uh, BBC did it um, in the 1960s, of boys and girls. And they put them in a room separately. There were about 10 boys and 10 girls with building blocks mm -hmm. and, and toys. 
Uh, the boys had no eye contact whatsoever and began immediately playing with the toys and bashing them and destroying them. Uh, and the girls uh, ignored the toys completely and started playing with each other's hair and looking into each other's eyes and saying, well, what's your name? Mm. Um, so there exists, I think, without boy bashing, because we love the boys, there exists at even that level mm -hmm. of five, six-year-olds, mm -hmm. this need for destruction, if you like, which maybe is a testosterone thing, or uh, uh, this need with girls to, to bond. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we'll, we'll go to the clip now, but these ladies have something very, very good to say. American armies and Pakistani army has used guns. Taliban may not have those sophisticated guns, but they have their own bodies. And you can buy a body, but you cannot buy the mind and the spirit of an individual. And as long as the spirit is alive, he will react. So what has happened in Suat is that this force of power has got together. They've completely crushed that beautiful valley in between. With the Taliban or with any other extremists, the best thing is try to understand their psyche. Their psyche is not correct. But you have to work through that psyche. Now their psyche is Islam. We are doing it for Islam. We are doing it for Sharia. It is the duty of people who are trying to establish order in that area to work through Islam. To say, okay, Islam forbids violence. That's the first principle of Islam. And you need to have enough people within Swat who can bring up evidence from Quran and say, wonderful, we want Islam. We want this rule. But we want a rule which is truly Islamic and tell the Taliban that let's work through the system. So we've heard a lot about what Americans think and feel about Pakistani and we've heard a lot about what us Brits think about Pakistanis too. <laughs> what about the other way around? What do Pakistanis think about the good old Americans? <laughs> Yeah, that, that was definitely one of the questions that I wanted to ask in Pakistan one-on-one. -on -one. Um, after I made The Muslims I Know and I screened it on a lot of university and college campuses, uh, we would have a Q&A after the screening. And many, many times people said, well, these are American Muslims, but what do Pakistanis think of us? Like right. back home, what do people think of us? So I wanted to kind of address that question. And so um, I asked Pakistanis, Lahoris, what do you think of Americans? Not the American government, not American foreign policy, the people of America. What do you think right. about them? And um, is, it, is it broadcastable? Yes. <laughs> 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 it totally is. I mean, I, that's, I have to say that that was one of the things that kind of surprised me when I did this film. I was expecting more anger. Right. And I didn't really get that. And I got extremely sensible answers to ah. all of my questions. So give I us an example. We'll see the clip in a bit, but give us um, an example. For example, you know, just uh, American foreign policy in the region. I mean, people do believe, for example, that drone attacks are not the way to go and that they cause immense suffering and that the death of a child or a woman or a man is just cannot be justified right. on the basis of anything. It just, just yes. not, it's not justifiable. So they f feel very strongly about that. But on the other hand, they were all very keen to work with the United States mm. um, and, you know, deal with different issues. So it's not like a, just a black, black and white kind of relationship that they see with the United States. They're definitely willing to work with them. Right. OK. Well, we'll go to the clip right now uh, about, about what they think about us <laughs> and, and Americans, actually. I cannot say America is a superpower in enlightening, but they are superpower in military. The media in U.S. is very strong. It is actually manipulating their public, and it's high time that they should wake up. But the thing is, there is still room for hope. I mean, uh, there are pe uh, people within the U.S. Uh, who know this. As far as the people of America is concerned, I don't think they are much different than us. Um, they have been disillusioned and, you know, uh, brainwashed by their governments, just as we have. People, most of the people there don't seem to agree with the war just like we do. Most of the people there want a change. Uh, their election of President Obama, that shows that they want a change. So I think we are pretty much the same people, the only difference being they being in America and we being in Pakistan. 
अमेरिकन पर्सन जितने भी हैं तकरीबन वो तो सही हैं आगे जो लीडर उनके आते हैं लीडर उनके अपनी पॉलिसियाँ बनाते हैं वो लोगों को लाइक नहीं करते जिस तरह भी है वो उनकी मर्जी है Can we um, touch briefly on the little Pakistani girl that was shot in the face, Malala? Um, what, first of all, what, as a woman, are your views of that? I mean, it's obviously a horrifying thing. It's a, it, it's a horrifying thing if a little girl gets shot because she wants to go to school and get educated. Um, but again, I think that it's important to see this in a political context, and it's important to understand that... Um, How do you mean in a, in a political context? Because I feel that um, you know, this happened in Sawat, which is uh, in the north of Pakistan. Right. And I think it's important for people to know that the government of Pakistan has never really been very engaged with the people of that region. And so they're as far as education, uh, as far as um, other government services, there, as there far as justice, for example. Is there a reason for that? Is there a north-south divide or something there? Oh, well, definitely. I think uh, in Pakistan, um, there are certain states and certain groups of people who kind of form, uh, who are kind of the elite of Pakistan. And then right. the rest of the population kind of just falls through the cracks, but they happen to be 80, 90 percent of the people in Pakistan. Right. <laughs> but those are not the people that we ever see. Those are not the people that we talk about. Um, and I think the fact that the Taliban have kind of taken over that area also has to do with this history of complete negligence on the part of the government. So you right. have to understand that. And the, the Taliban are nothing more than, I believe, these criminal gangs. And mm. they've kind of taken over that, that, um, that a, a particular city or a town. And um, it's kind of like a mafia, if right. you will. Yep. Um, and, and, the, and the government has not been able to do anything about it. So it's, it's part of that story. It's not just the Taliban being this uh, evil force that mm. you can blame everything on. Uh, of course, what they did was reprehensible. Mm. But why is that possible? How is that happening? You have to understand that context as well. Right. I mean, well, now it is surely it's on the world stage. It's mm -hmm. now surely highlighted. So the government will hopefully will be doing something about it. Right. But from from that one terrible incident is that um, is that the way women are perceived in Pakistan um, it, that they shouldn't have education is that what the majority of, of folks think out there no I don't think that that's how the majority of people uh, view women I mean some people might view women that way and I'm sure that some people view women that way in this country as well absolutely. You know, that they yeah. like to put controls on women absolutely um, because it's it's a lot about power and control you know, you can call it um, honor killing, or you can call it uh, forcing someone to wear the hijab, yeah. or you can call it uh, rape in the U.S. military, where about one in four women get raped. Mm. Yeah. So that's a really large number yes, of women getting absolutely. raped by their own colleagues, yes. and the army not doing anything about yeah. it. Oh, yeah. um, so, you know, you can call it all of these different names, but it's always about power and control. control. And so I'm always very interested in what are the socio-political uh, factors that are making that possible. And so in Sawat, you know, the, 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 like I said, the government has always been very conspicuous by its absence. Right. Yeah. And so that's why this kind of mafia can exist, and this is just a way for them to control. Eye-opening stuff, eh? So finally, Mara. Um, you're working on a project currently, um, which is about India and the partition of India. Yes. Would you like to give us a bit of info on that? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm collaborating with an Indian filmmaker who's based in New Delhi. And so we're shooting interviews on both sides of the border. Uh, her family was um, based in Lailpur, which is now Faisalabad in Pakistan. And at the time of partition, they, were, they had to immigrate to Delhi. And my mother's family is from Gurgaon, which is now a suburb of New Delhi. Right. And they had to immigrate to Pakistan in 1947. Right. So it was so interesting that when I met her in, uh, in Rochester, we immediately bonded and we started talking about the partition. Mm. And we just, we felt like we were meant to make a film together. Right. So um, it's, it's a film that's, it's kind of coming from a very personal point of view because both of our families were affected by the partition and both of us grew up with stories 
mm. uh, about partition. And of course, India at the moment is very much in the news with uh, its treatment of, of its ladies, etc. Will you incorporate things like the, the terrible rape, etc., um, and the destruction that goes on against women? Would you incorporate that into your film? Um, no, that, that's not really the subject of the film. The right. subject of the film is very much partition in 1947, and I think the idea is to kind of um, look back at a time pre-partition, right. uh, prior to 1947, when Hindus and Muslims and Christians and uh, a lot of Sikhs, you know, a lot of different religious groups and uh, ethnic groups were able to coexist in India right. for thousands of years. Yes. So I feel very strongly that what's happening, the animosity between the two countries and what's happening now is very political. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not really based in history and it's almost like an aberration. It's like right. a historical aberration. It's very new. It, 1947 mm -hmm. is not that long ago because there is this, this very, very old tradition in the Indian and subcontinent of immense diversity and people being able to coexist. I mean, of course, there was conflict and there were problems. I'm not saying that it was all peachy and perfect yeah. all the time, yeah. but that coexistence is possible and was possible for thousands of years. And therefore, what can we learn from that and how can we move forward from right. there? So that's kind of the idea of the film. So if you can um, get uh, coexistence and peace of those two, then you'll have done your job, I guess. Yes. Well, Mara Ahmed, it's been an absolute delight. <laughs> Thank um, you. As I said, we're going to give the website details up on the screen, um, and we can obviously see your films there. Um, please do come over and see us again. Thank you very much. Thank you.